we've got a family meeting today. But before we do that, we want to spend time in God's Word. So it's not going to be a long sermon, uh, but just a necessary time in God's Word. So we're going to be in the book of Acts today, uh, the very beginning of the church. Right after the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and before you get into all the letters, this was... I mean, Jesus and the Gospels had been preparing his people. What would it look like when, when he left? What would it look like to be the church? I'm primarily going to look at Acts chapter 2, some important verses there. But I want to pick up in Acts chapter 1. But before we look at that, we've got a mission statement here at Houston Church. Loving, living, leading others to Jesus Christ. That's our mission. Now, I've been a part of many different organizations. I'm sure most, if not all of you have as well, that they have mission statements. And sometimes that's just something on paperwork. Um, but we desire here at Houston Church that we truly live out this mission. And if you go to different churches, you'll see that there are different Mission statements, but they're all, if it is a church of Jesus Christ, it's going to essentially come down to the same stuff. And that's the stuff that I think we see in our mission statement. Loving, living, and leading others to Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 2. And we're going to see the development of a body of believers that rose up and became a people who were doing just that, loving, living, and leading others to Jesus. So let's look at Acts chapter 1 to start just the first few verses, if you're flipping along with me. I'm going to pick up, I'm not going to read the first few, it kind of gives some intro material, but beginning in verse, verse 6. <clears throat> so when they had come together, now keep in mind, Jesus died on the cross, buried, dead, rose again, conquered death, rose again from the grave, exited that tomb, and he spent a period of time revealing himself to his followers. And so these followers, they came together with Jesus, right? So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He rose again. This is it. Let's go into eternity, the best stuff. And he said to them, it is actually going to be in April 2024 when there's some eclipse that's streaking across a certain part of the United States. Uh, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Sumeria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. He ascended into heaven. Can you imagine their frustration? All right, this is it. We've gotten together. This is when Jesus is going to do his thing. And, and all the cool stuff. You talked about the end, end times. It's now. Jesus, is this the time? They wanted to know a timeline. I'll tell you what. Sometimes I get into that mode. I want to know timelines. I, like I like to have a little bit of control so I know what's ahead of me, right? Y'all like control? I love control. I'm not going to admit it most of the time, but I'm going to be honest here. I love control. They clearly was like, okay, tell us the exact steps, right? It's coming. He says, you're not to know. The times. But what you, here is what you need to know. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Jesus talked a lot about power. Jesus just demonstrated his power. He says, yep, I'm about to leave, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit. See, the Father sent the Son. The Son sent the Spirit, and the Spirit brings the power of God. He's going to bring them into the lives of those who are in Christ, those who are his church. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Not like, I hope you'll be my witnesses. Now you need to try to be my witnesses. But if you are in Christ, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. They wanted a timeline. He gave them a mission. He said, church, be faithful. Be the church. So then they had to wait around. He said, wait around in Jerusalem, which was like, were all the enemy, I mean, the people that were going to try to kill them. I mean, it was 
pretty much the most stressful place you'd have to be when they were waiting. But they were waiting. And then jumping ahead into Acts chapter 2. And I'll work off the slides here for this morning since we're going a little shorter. Acts chapter 2. We've got a begin. Now, right before the verses we're going to look at in verse 22, believers, they would come to Jerusalem for these feasts, for these important feasts that, that marked um, time for, for the Jews of the day. And they're celebrating Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came in power in a very miraculous way. And all believers in Christ had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within them for the first time. And so this powerful demonstration, the power of the Spirit, and then a powerful proclamation. Peter, one of the disciples, who now, ha- now was empowered and emboldened by the Holy Spirit, spoke truth. He spoke the gospel. And we're, gonna, we're not going to read the whole, like, it's like 40 verses. I, I'm pulling some snippets out in Acts chapter 2. Verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourself know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of of death. They just had a demonstration of power, and he reminded, hey, this power all originated in the power of Jesus Christ, right, who showed up and did mighty works and mighty signs. He did that. Last week, we talked about the seven sign miracles in the book of John, but the most mighty work and most mighty sign was when he died on a cross, crucified in our place, and rose again. God raised him up, and he defeated death, that's, an empowerful, that's a powerful, powerful fact that they needed to remember to be the church. That's a powerful fact that we need to remember for us to be the church. This Jesus died in our place and gives us the power of God to be his church. Let's continue. Skip, so the verses I skipped, he's going to quote, a, quote an Old Testament reference that was brought from David. David was pretty significant in the life of the Jews. It's going to be called a patriarch here, right? He was one of the people of promise of the line of David. I mean, they, they knew of David, and David was significant. I mean, of important men, important godly men, I mean, David was right up there. Verse 29, brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, right? Getting him hyped about David. That he both died and was buried. Okay, we, that's familiar language. And his tomb is with us to this day, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we also are witnesses. They, he starts hyping up David. And points out David died, and David is still dead in a tomb, right? Jesus is so much more than any other person ever in history. He did not stay dead. He is raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, Peter says. Continue on. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out This that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus that you have crucified. Know this for certain. The Father sent the Son The Son sent the Spirit, and the Spirit has been poured out into the lives of all believers, and that is central to who we are as a church. Know that it was God that did this. Let's keep going. Now, when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart. The gospel, truth, the word of God had been proclaimed to them. And when the word of God is proclaimed, it cuts to the heart. It changed them. People were transformed, and now we see the Word of God moving and the Spirit of God at work in a powerful way. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you. 
and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. This promise is for you. He was speaking to the people right in front of him, and he was speaking to us 2,000 years later. Jesus died in our place and rose again so we can have newness of life. And when, when we receive that, when we repent, which means change the direction of our lives, no longer living for ourselves, but changing the direction of our lives, we become part of the church. A lot of times in our culture today, we think being a church means this is, this is where my membership is. This is what my parents were and my grandparents were, so this is, I am this church, right? Th- those are all nice things, but you are only part of the church if you repented. You change the direction of your life to turn, to say, I'm not going to live for myself, my own selfish ambition. I'm going to be a child of God. I'm going to be in his church, and it's that easy. And we demonstrate that by identifying as part of his church, baptism. Right? There's a lot more that we can unpack in a larger sermon, but um, salvation is by grace through faith. Faith. Faith not in myself, but in Jesus who died for me, and you're part of his church. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's just the beginning of the amazing life God has in store for you when you get to experience the abundant blessing of being part of the church. The big C church and part of a local church, which is a local expression of the big C church. Let's see what happened next. They're cut to the heart. They heard the word, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. God, Jesus is reaching out. Take his hand. Receive it. Become a child of God. So those who received his word were baptized, and those who were added that day, about 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls! 3,000 people, because they heard the word of the Lord proclaimed, and the Holy Spirit moved. Wow. And that, that, that same Spirit of God is alive and active in his church today. And so, okay, it's not just 12 disciples and a handful of other followers of Jesus. Now we got a church. Now we've got the beginning of the church. So what did the church do? Let's look and see the activity of the church that first early church. That's what I just, before we start talking about logistics of Heaston Church. Let's look at the marks of the early church. And they devoted themselves. That's such a good word, devoted themselves. To the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord God added to their number day by day those who were being saved. A few significant things to note here. We see four Marks of the church. We could probably dig around and probably identify some more. There's a lot in these little verses. Four marks of the the church. The apostles' teaching. Loving, living, and leading Jesus Christ. Right? The word of God is always our guide. And that is something that Houston Church has always held high. That we will, that we, this will be our guide. Right? There are some things that are very clear that guides us as a church. There are other things that are not as clear. And we navigate that as a church. Um, Salvation is clear. The stuff that made the church is the church is absolutely clear. It's about knowing the facts in here, but it's not just, it's not just a list of rules and, and, and how to live and all that. This is about entering into a story, the word of God, what God has been doing since the very beginning of the world and what he is still doing. The disciples wanted to know, tell us the time. Well, that part's actually, the time is, is in this book. But we find ourselves in the story from what Jesus already did and what Jesus is going to do. We find ourselves in the story of this book. And that is what the church does, is discovering their identity in this story. That's the first mark of the church. And the second is the fellowship. Y'all picturing like your best plate of potluck meal right now when you hear fellowship? That's very easy to do because that's what we talk about. We talk about fellowship and together, right? And a lot of times we figure it's usually around, a, around food. And the, boy, this is a powerful word. It's the Greek word koinonia, the common life, right? This is about shared life together, fellowshipping together, right? This is something very distinct that the people of God do. And it's not just a a koinonia with each other because uh, elsewhere in Scripture it talks about we have fellowship with Jesus. 
because we have that common life with Jesus. We have this oneness with God because we are in Christ, right? Then we experience that with one another, that koinonia. We see some of that fleshed out here. They, all who believed were together. They had all things in common. Now, it would be very easy to take this and, and, and look at it with a, a, a lens and say, whoa, we got like socialism, communist stuff kind of going on right here, right? No, this is not a government mandated kind of thing. This is kind of like, because we have koinonia, we belong to each other. We're going to look out for one another, right? We're going to care for one another. And when we see needs, because I've got that koinonia type of heart, I've got fellowship with Christ and with each other, as I'm able, I will meet those needs, sometimes financial, but sometimes it's serving in the church. The church has needs, and we'll talk about some of those. That is um, the common life, koinonia fellowship. Second one is the breaking of bread. This could mean a couple different things. Uh, it's possible that this is talking about uh, the Lord's Supper, communion, the sacrament that we celebrate together to remember what Christ has done. So we can kind of see worship as a part of that. And it's true that worship is a mark of the church. This is probably a more general sense of just that intimate breaking of bread with each other, right? A very intimate relationship. When you're brothers and sisters in Christ, that's a special bond. That's something you do inside the church, but you also do it outside the church. Note that they were... Day by day, attending the temple together and, break, and breaking in their homes. They were in the, the central place of worship, but they were also scattered. Gathered and scattered. That's what the church is. I'll tell you what, we are all busy lives. We, I got four kids. We just entered baseball season. My goodness, I know about ba- crazy lives. We, we've got to be in three places at once. There's only two people who can drive. We've got a few more months. I'm ready to throw the keys at my son and just say, go, because like, we don't have time to be in all the places. Uh, I get it. We're all busy, but uh, the church is gathered and scattered, and so how can you how can you make your schedule in such a way so that you can be part of the church, not just receiving a blessing once a week, because this is awesome when we gather, but experiencing the fullness of being Christ's church, not in a way that you get burnt out, but just being part of the church. And the fourth one is prayer. We've got to be a people of prayer. When we stop praying, we say, I can depend on myself. I don't need to depend on God. The church prays. So these are marks of the church. I like what's at the beginning and at the end, right? They devoted themselves to faithfulness, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. We're going to have a family meeting. We're going to talk about some of the logistics of the church. And we're looking at some of, the, some of the areas where maybe we had people serving before and we don't. And it's very easy to kind of scratch our head and be like, I don't think this is possible. I don't think this can be a good thing. We lost too many people in this area. And this, you know what? It's already blown my mind to see God's faithfulness here at Houston Church. It's blown my mind to see how he has shown up in unexpected ways. And we will continue to move forward in faithfulness. And when we do, he's going to provide. But we got to be faithful. So what happened after this? You know, I bet this was like the coolest picture. Like, yeah, we're the church. We're the first 3,000. Everything's perfect. I love every single one of you. And we've got doctrine perfectly right. And they probably did agree on all the essentials at the time. And so they probably didn't argue because it was pretty awesome being part of that first Pentecost. And then we get, turn the page from Acts and we get into these letters. We see these early churches. They had a whole bunch of mess. They had mess and arguments over teaching. They had mess and arguments over their fellowship and the one another's, you know, they were just squabbling over dumb stuff. They had, you know, they, they had to be shown how to pray and all these things. The church has always had mess, right? We're not perfect. But the church of Jesus Christ is willing to put, put, put aside the mess in our own individual lives so we can let Jesus heal, like, work in our lives, put it aside, so that the Holy Spirit can do his thing and bring out a good and beautiful church despite imperfect people. I could go a lot further on this. We've covered some of that, and we're going we're to go through Ephesians. We're going to see one of the letters to the early church um, beginning next week. I'm excited to go through Ephesians. Ephesians is such a great letter. It's six chapters long, and it's all about being the church in the first three chapters, is this, this is what makes us the church. This is who we are in Christ. This is your identity. Three chapters of making sure we get our identity right. 
what difference does Jesus make in our lives? And then it's three more chapters. It's very symmetrical. I love, I love when things are symmetrical. Everything just lines up just right. The last three ch- chapters, last half, it begins with a big fat, therefore. Therefore, all this goodness that Jesus has done in your life, individually and as the church, this is how you live as the church. And you get three chapters of what it looks like to live as a church. So that's what we're doing in Ephesians. And I, I think that's such an important message to recenter and help guide us, right? Because I tell you what, it's very easy to have finger point about it. It's his fault, her fault, this is fault. This should have been done differently. Um, but I can only fix myself. You can only fix yourself. And if we, if we will each really center ourselves on who we are in our Christ and, and, and just open ourselves to healing and, and to repentance and, let, and conviction of sin and, and the forgiveness we have, if we'll all take that step, something beautiful is going to come out of that. So what is, where does this lead us? What does this mean to Houston Church, a church that desires to love, live, and lead others to Jesus Christ? I'm going to invite up the elders right now, and I think I've got a couple people who are going to help put uh, those six chairs right up here. We're going to, um, we've got this family meeting. Now let me tell you about how it's kind of set up. We have three different phases. The first will be the elder, uh, elder-led portion of it, and there will be a Q&A after that, after they speak. The second portion, uh, elders will still be up here, but we'll, we're going to have a ministry update, and you'll hear from different staff members about what that, that looks like. And then there will be a Q&A after that with time available. Okay? Um, then the worship service will be concluded, but a five-minute break, if you will. And if anybody has questions about the past decision. If anybody wants to wrestle with some of the tougher stuff, that's for after we conclude and have a five-minute break. We don't want to push aside any tough questions, but we we already had a family meeting that was a lot tougher and a a lot where we wrestled with hurt. That's not the goal of the first two-thirds of this, right? Because We know that some people are ready to move on. And so we want the tone of this first section. And Randy's going to start passing out some sheets if anybody wants to help with that. And Debbie, we got got two people on each side. Those are coming out. Um, The first two sections, we want the tone to be more, want to be forward thinking. We're talking about how to move forward as a church. But if the elders are available after we conclude the service, if, if anybody would still like to discuss, address, ask questions about anything in the the past. So we just ask that you would honor the flow of that uh, so we can have a very forward f- focused conversation at this point. Lord, I just ask that you prepare our hearts for this meeting so that we can hear what needs to be heard, say what needs to be said, God, and we can have a, a, a bigger vision of what it means to, to live as your church, to be your church. God, be glorified in this time. Bring clarity. May your Holy Spirit move. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Thomas and Garrett, if it's possible to dim these lights up here. I'm not sure if you guys know, but that, yeah. Is that better? Jeffrey's going to speak first. I'll hand him the, the uh, microphone here. Let's see. Where was... I got it. Oh, you got a microphone? Okay. Um, but our elder board here is Jeffrey, David, Lynn, Sid, and Mike. And as interim lead pastor, I, on an, the interim basis, I'm currently part of the elder board. morning. Can you hear me? I haven't practiced this, so I'm going to stumble through it a little bit. Um, I'll identify our elders. I think it's already been done. Um, Most of us, I think, we've been on the board a long time. Um, 
the way we function, I, I don't know exactly how I want to say that, but we try to meet monthly as a board. In the last year, we have done more than that, uh, and we will do more than once a month if the need arises. Um, we discuss the business of the church, the finances, um, we pray for the sick, we pray for the staff, we pray for our missionaries, um, and then we address issues that have been brought up um, that need to be talked about, need to have a decision made on them. Um, we start our meetings with prayer um, for a variety of things. All of you, um, not on an individual basis, but we spend probably the first 10 minutes or longer in prayer, and we close in prayer. Um, some of the things that have, or one of the things that has developed out of our situation that we have just went through and where we're at, we will do some work on clarifying our doctrine, doctrinal statement, um, and anything else that needs to be addressed in what, what and how we believe. Um, we are prayerfully considering a search team right now for the lead pastor, and that is our main focus. So I would ask you to pray about that. We don't know who the team members are, but I would, I would just ask you to pray about that and um, think about that. It, it's an important situation or a decision that we will have to make, and if you're asked, it will be very important. Um, we, we're just looking, praying to God to show us what that team needs to look like. And let me tell you, that might take a month or two maybe longer if we meet a little more if we decide that we need to move or meet more often and we can do that by telephone we've figured out how to connect everyone and it is important to us to move forward as quickly as possible but you need to understand once that search team is selected and those that are serving that decision for that pastor not only made in the first month. This could take some time. We will send out um, notifications that we are looking for a pastor, and then we will receive applications. Um, so I don't have a timeline. God does, but I don't. So be patient with us. Understand that we are doing the best that we can. We do take it seriously. Um, and understand also the lead pastor must be hired before we fill any other positions that have been created by what's happened in our church. So pray for us. Um, we, we need it. Um, I will tell you that for me, and I'm sure I can speak for the rest of them, and I won't go into questions right now about it, but we took a lot of time, and this decision has been painful, and still is. So, uh, the next thing, uh, we're, I'm gonna move on to uh, uh, the business side of it. Um, overall, Houston continues to be in excellent financial position. And God continues to provide for the church, even with a potential challenging year ahead, we are blessed to not have to worry about our financial position. Um, as you're, Do you all have a, a balance sheet? Yes. Okay. Um, we have a approximately $757,000 in cash as of the end of 23 with no debt. 
Um, additionally, we have approximately 632,000 in invested in Edward Jones for our building fund. And that is, there's a hundred thousand dollars donated and um, earmarked for billing fund. The rest of that money is not earmarked for a billing fund. It, we just had that account and that's where we put it. One thing I want you to know, we are looking at where to invest this money. We are not uh, in the business of gathering money and investing it. We want to invest it in the kingdom. And I, again, we don't know what that looks like, but we pray that God will open doors, open our hearts, show us where the need may be, even right here at Easton Church. But we are very blessed to be in the position we're in. I remember when I first came on this elder board, our budget was 75000 And we were every year 10000 short. And it didn't matter every year. And by the grace of God, passed that. And um, we have been blessed financially and, and ministerially. God has blessed this church and will continue to do so. Um, if you drop down to the income statements, notes, 2023 was an, another strong financial year with total givings of approximately $940,000. In 2023, giving income exceeded our expenses by approximately 85000 With our high cash balance at the bank, we are earning significant interest. In 2023 alone, we earned approximately $24,000 in income. But again, we didn't feel like that money could just be sitting there. It need to be working until we can find or God open the door. Here's where I want you to spend some money. So we are in that position. Um, the budget will naturally be smaller and will be reassessed. There we did we have to we have to go over but we have to do a new budget process. And we will announce that to you as soon as we get that finished. That'd be correct. Um, I guess it's question and answer time. Yes. If anyone has any questions, I'll go ahead and when you raise your hand, I'll call on you and I'll repeat your question because your question will not be heard on camera and we are recording this. So who, does anybody have any question for the elders before we get to the ministry update? Search process, budget. Tyler. So the question, comment, was um, a suggestion that we should hire a pastor from the outside from our relationships during this phase. Well, I wouldn't I mean that we would take names from outside people that we know that are in ministry. Is that what you're saying? Okay. The, the uniqueness of a search committee is I, I was fortunate to be the, the lead elder on the search committee when Justin was hired. But mm -hmm. when you go through that process, it takes a long time. And 
the input that the people of that committee give, uh, I think is very valuable. I mean, um, it's amazing when you have a number of people, when God is working, how you get unity in that decision. And w what Tyler's talking about would be things that we would gather, and that's how we would come up with candidates, but I still feel there's a definite value in viewpoints from different people people on a committee because some people have kids some people I mean there's just a wide variances and when you pray together and when you, you you look through applications and you it's just a unique process that has a lot of value to it so and we will have elder influence on that search committee I mean not, not obviously one or two of the elders will be on the committee but like Lynn said I think it's very important that we get input from the congregation and <clears throat> we will come up with a list of people that we we think that that would be valuable and and do a good job on the search committee and and some may choose not to uh it's which is why it might take a little while to put the search committee together but but we we want <clears throat> people uh, all across our congregation with various interests and and uh, you know uh, i know in the past we have had a youth representative I, I don't, I don't, I don't know who all is going to be on the committee this time. We will, we'll look and see who's available and who's willing to serve. Try and get representatives from all the age groups. Um, just a, a general, broad cross section of the church, uh, and they will go through the applications. And, and to Tyler's, we will re be reaching out to those people, all of those people, as well as as others that are may, maybe not associated as as tightly as the Max Barnetts and all of those. And, we're going to do a nationwide search, but, you know, God has in mind who he has chosen for Eastern Church, and we're looking to him, and we're depending on him to bring that person forward, and that's, that's how we, that's how I think that's how we need to go forward. And I would challenge each one of you that might be a member of that committee that it takes time, and, um, you know, when you commit to that, uh, we, you know, it's a, it's a big task. It's, um, it's something that you shouldn't take lightly. But if you are part of that, just, uh, just know that it's, it's very important to devote time to, to coming up with the right candidate. Did you have a question, Carol? question was how much did how much donation came in for the first missions giving Sunday it, I, I think we're close to 30,000 I think so too about $30,000 um, and we will have some changes on how um, much we need to raise I think it's a fair assessment um, because Joel has taken over the children's ministry and Carmen, Joel and Carmen with help. So Joel will become staff and part and one of the things with our mission giving Sundays was raising money for his support. For so we we're just looking at this, so bear in mind things could change, but that's one of the things that we talked about at our last meeting. Uh, no, no. Excuse me. Yeah, we will continue to support them. They'll get their support. But I think I'm safe in saying this. We won't have to raise as much money in our mission giving Sundays as we did before. Does that make sense? Because his salary will be in our budget now, not in our mission giving Sundays. Is that correctly said? So whatever our missionaries are getting, they will continue to get. Huh? No, that's fine. Um, and I would, I would just encourage you, yes, we're in wonderful financial shape, but please don't quit giving. <laughs> I don't want to have to lean on several of you to step it up that I know have it, so 
uh, we lift that up to you. And, and it's part of being a church. Is your giving is, is um, part of ministry. Okay. Um, Additional questions? Yeah, any more questions? Anywhere? Um, go ahead. I'm staying. <laughs> I'm staying. <laughs> so, um, we're, you know, immediately saw what God was doing here, and it's just really funny how God can, really gives you a heart for right where you're at. Ten years of shoulder to shoulder uh, with all of you. Um, and what's wild is, you know, God, God had given, I've, I've never would have considered this type of role. Um, but I see God, he's going to, he's going to bring us forward. And our family uh, knows that you know, th there's question marks about two years, three years down the road. But um, we're here to transition to a good spot. And um, I don't know if excited is the right word. But I know that our, our family, um, we're ready to move forward to a, a very good future. So. Anything else? Good. I think that, I, yeah, I've heard this this morning, and we're blessed. Let, let, we're, me, let me just add for the camera, Randy gave a powerful testimony, a testimony of a new family that shared their testimony of coming to Keystone Church just now. Go ahead. Yeah. So there are people coming to our church for a reason, new people. And we'll get into that in a little bit after we do our quest. I think it comes later that we need to talk about that, if that's okay. Um, we have new families that are coming back that haven't been here in a long time. I don't know what all that means. But I know people are coming because of the decision that was made. And um, that sounds hard, but we will get into that later. And... Um, God is working for you. Okay. Um, anything else? Okay. What else do you want to do this? Yeah. Okay. Or you can hold on to that if you want, just okay. in case you all. Oh, well, yeah, we'll hand it to Joel when he gets up here. But So we would like to address just some min ministry updates. And, you know, for the church to be the church, um, you need to know wh what's going on in the different ministry areas. And we're hoping to cast some vision about some service opportunities. I mean, like I said earlier in the sermon portion, um, everybody's got a lot going on. We don't want to ask anybody to serve more than their capacity. But there may be areas where you say, you know what, I can give something a try. Or I'm someone that, that you can call on when you don't have anybody else doing it. And those, that is incredibly helpful, all those things. Uh, so we are trying to build new teams. But, I mean, there's just some entry-level things that people can do to just help us move forward as a church. And so you should have a handout with you. We've had sign-up sheets. Um, I know how it goes. You're coming and going. You forget to even look at a sign-up sheet sometimes. But we have something in your hand. If you're able to turn it into us today, great. Down the road uh, is fine, too. Uh, with just some areas where, where if you're interested in serving in any of those areas, and we've just kind of highlighted some, and I'm going to talk about the first two. First off, getting connected. We talked about that Koinonia Fellowship, and um, 
that's going to be central to the life of our, shir- our church. We need to be doing life together. Now, I'll say, uh, you know, because we've had groups that have, have uh, just all of our group structure changed with the transition. So some groups are still moving forward as they had been, maybe lose a person or two, but other groups are... Um, um, it's just changed. And so right now, I don't have all the answers about, hey, we have this group available. We have this Sunday school available. We got a couple classes that are talking about combining to make sure we have mixed Sunday school options. But the important thing for you all to know is we, it's so important that you find a place to get connected. And so there are care groups. There are some established care groups that have been going on for a while. They tend to meet once a month or so. Sometimes it's more or less than that. And um, I, um, I meant to talk to care group leaders today, uh, before today. I didn't get a chance to, but I think most of them are open for whoever would like to come and just, um, I mean, you don't have to commit to the group right away. Just get to know some people. So we'll get some more details out if you'd like to try some of those care groups. Uh, also, gatherings for families with some kids. We're going to start promoting some times um, where families with kids can get together Um, because I just see that as one of the real big needs right now for our kids to get connected and for parents to just be reassured that their kids have friends and you know we are growing we've lost kids we've also gained some new kids Uh, but we'll we'll start promoting some dates come talk to me um, one-on-one if you're interested in that and um, that's what we want to do so there can be informal things this not everything has to be publicized by the church and advertised by the church we just need to be doing life together so if you've got outside of the box ideas of how to do that uh, please do that and I'll help you promote it if it's something that we can help promote uh, because we want you all to be in relationship in community Uh, there's multiple Tuesday Bible studies I don't know if that the the morning one is uh, is it taking a break soon we got five more weeks Okay, so that's, that's, uh, is that available? Come on. So talk to Melinda. There's other women that are involved with that um, on Tuesday mornings. Uh, upcoming potlucks. We got youth, we'll mention, uh, youth and kids are combining for um, uh, bringing back Super Bowl Sunday, which was always around the big game. But you know what? We, we missed the big game opportunity. That's okay. We'll still cook soups, cook chilies. So if you want to bring your submissions, we'll enjoy that potluck at the end of the month. It's going to be glorious. We'll have a pie auction. So if you want to make your best pie, please let me. Uh, I've got some volunteers that they don't know my, they're my volunteers yet, but they're uh, about to. And uh, um, you talk to them. But um, uh, it's always a really good time. And uh, we'll do, have those occasionally. We had one last month, but that's the next one coming. And that will raise money for our youth and our kids to go to camp. Vacation Bible School is one of the coolest ways. If you are available in the evenings, uh, June, it's like the last week of June, jo- Joel will talk about it. Uh, he'll talk about other aspects. But I just want to say from a community aspect, that's really cool because you, you serve with people you don't normally see in the church. And uh, I just see amazing Koinonia Fellowship happening there. So that's getting connected. Uh, next, I want to talk about worship, I believe, is what we have, have next. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm the, also the interim worship pastor, apparently, now. No, uh, my goal is not to wear all the hats. Uh, but we've got certain areas of the church where we've got a lot of good volunteers that just need a little leadership to bring together. And so right now, we're just trying to rebuild the worship team. Jimmy and Mateo and Josh uh, and Chris, they are rocks that have been leading us in worship for a long time. Yeah. And it's amazing what they've stepped up and done. I'm thankful for them. Um, We would like to to add more pieces so these guys can have a break. That's part of the reason I stepped up uh, into this because I for while while, you know they could have led without me, I just kind of foresaw well one of these days both of them are going to be on vacation at the same time. So the more pieces we have in play, we've got a worship team. We're aiming for a blended worship model. You know, there's always talk about well it should be traditional, should be contemporary, whatever. Um, We're going to try to bring in the hymns of old and contemporary tunes and play it in the style that you've been hearing these last couple of weeks. If you have any questions about that, come talk to me. But that's, that's kind of where we're going to try to be, a, be worship that is good for the whole church. <laughs> um, serving opportunities. Um, yeah, band and vocals, that's obvious. Instruments is always hard. Please don't feel like you have to be an expert to, to you know, we just need to make a joyful noise up here. Y'all do the rest. You don't care if we mess up. Um, but... AV booth. Sounds intimidating. It's not. Um, we've got a couple people that are holding down the fort there. Uh, doing the slides. I mean, if you could press your mouse button, you can do that. 
It's, it's actually, I mean, there's some things that we can show you, but there is zero pressure. If you screw up, no one cares. And uh, we, we just need to rebuild that. And sound is, e- is also easier than it sounds. Um, if, you're, if you're one of those people that doesn't mind coming in early and helping us set up, Sometimes it's just having someone that can come in and turn on all the things. Last week, I learned that that was the hardest part of being an inner worship <coughs> pastor, turning on all the things. But you got somebody else that's not preaching that day, it's not that hard. You just turn some things on. So, that serving opportunities in worship. And uh, next, we have first impressions and hospitality. Um, we kind of had a, a good, beefed-up first impressions team before. Good um, welcome team because our goal was to kind of spread throughout the entire church because um, that's just a good thing to do, just have layers throughout the church to help people along because one of the hardest things to do is to step into a new church. Uh, We forget how scary it is to step into a new church. Right now we're simplifying things, right, because we don't want to, we're not going to try to schedule 10 people in a week. I think it was like six or seven, I don't remember, but just having a few scheduled. But here's what you need to know. Every single one of you can be a welcome team member. Every single one of us should be a welcome team member, and we need to keep that in mind as our team is going to be smaller uh, so we can be a welcoming church. Um, we do need a few people that, can, that are just able to work the computer. Whenever you can't figure it out, that's fine. We've got stickers right there. Just slap a sticker on the kid, give it to, to mom. They'll be good to go. Uh, but if you're willing to help with that side of things, uh, Jana and Randy Ferguson are points of contacts. They're right over there in the middle there. I'm pointing them out. There you go. Um, coffee. and uh, Coffee, I think we asked people to get in there like, uh, I'm not going to give you time. I, can, I don't remember what it was. But a, not a very early time. Like, so you don't have to come in too early. But if you wanted to come in early, that's helpful to just have someone that's doing the coffee each day and just um, making sure that they're refilled and all that. Donuts, we have people that are picking up donuts in town. And when we don't have donuts, we got some hangry kids around here. So uh, this is is an area of service. um, So consider hospitality, first impressions. That's a very easy entry level. And with that, I'm going to invite up Thomas. And we'll give the microphone to him to talk youth. Well, good morning again. Whoa. Good morning. Cool. All right. So uh, with youth, um, we have, we've seen uh, some cool stuff happen over the last month or so. Uh, as as we saw church wide, uh, we saw uh, a pretty significant drop uh, in uh, the number of students coming on our Wednesday evenings. Uh, but that number has has begun to grow back. Um, so over the last several weeks, uh, we we've seen an increase week over week. Uh, and there's some excitement. There's lots of new faces, which is great. Uh, so the, the youth is, is going well. It's growing. It's, it's, um, it's back to healthy. Uh, and so we're, we're looking forward. Um, the, the two major things to put in front of you all uh, is we are moving uh, towards camp. Uh, we are going to be going back to Falls Creek again this year in July. We're still working on nailing down the exact week and the exact dates uh, so that information will be coming as soon as we can get it sorted out uh, with Falls Creek, but that is, uh, that's sort of the plan right now, more information to come as we get it. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to speak with you all about uh, is our adult team back there. Um, the team needs some rebuilding. Uh, we, are, we are short on uh, adults in the room. Um, Right now, it's myself, my wife, Ashley, and Josh. Uh, And Josh uh, thought it was really important to be in charge of a job in Norman for, you know, bills paying and all that. Um, And so he sometimes has a hard time getting here right now because he's got to come from Norman uh, when he gets off work and fly straight here. Um, So no shade to Josh. He's doing all the good stuff. So... um, But if, if you are interested in, like, loving students because Jesus loves students and you ought to also do that uh, I'm putting a lot of pressure here um, so if you love Jesus uh, you should come talk to me uh, because we have students who need people who love Jesus to speak into their lives uh, so if you don't come talk to me I'm going to assume you don't love no I'm not going to go that far um, but uh, that's going to be our main focus over the next uh, the next couple of months is just rebuilding uh, our adult team uh, to be able to really pour into these students 
uh, to love them, to point them to Jesus, uh, and just to sort of do life with them. Uh, and there is a, a bit of a stigma, uh, which is unfair and untrue, uh, that you need to be young and cool to work with students. For a long time, there was a thing called the National Youth Workers Convention, and it was where uh, youth workers from all over the country would gather for three days somewhere, uh, once, once a year. Uh, there was usually five to 8,000 of us that showed up at some convention center uh, and just had a, a bit of a convention. And nobody got more attention and, like, ske- and meetings scheduled than the people who had been in ministry, been in student ministry for 40 plus years. Uh, we, there was uh, one lady, you know, always like, who's been in ministry the longest? One lady won every year. Uh, she was 84 uh, and had been in youth ministry since her 20s. Uh, so she's got 60 years, uh, which is longer than most of us have been alive. So um, if you think you're too old, you're not. Uh, all you have to be willing to do is love students and eat pizza. Um, and if you think you're not cool enough, you are. Because uh, students don't care how cool you are, how young you are. They just care uh, if you get to know them. Right? There's the mantra, uh, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, to which I always add. But if you care, you'll tell them what you know. Uh, so if you're interested uh, in working with students and, and being a part of that team, please uh, come talk to me uh, over the next couple of weeks. We'd love to, I'd love to get coffee uh, because I love coffee. Uh, but I'd love to get coffee in and chat with you about what that would look like. Hmm? Any questions? Yeah, Melinda. That's true. That's the other thing is we feed our students every week uh, because hungry students don't listen. <laughs> so uh, maybe you don't want to come hang out with students all the time. That's okay. Can you cook? If you can't, that's okay. Can you, can you order food? Um, probably, if you can't cook, you're probably real good at ordering food. Uh, so uh, we have a, we have a sign-up online. Uh, it's on the youth Facebook page. It's pinned right to the top uh, with a schedule where you can just write in your name uh, on any particular date you'd like to bring the, the meal. And, and if you could provide a meal uh, for the students, that would be incredible. Uh, they very much look forward to it, as do I. Any other questions? If you do that, it's not a little extra. It's a lot extra because they're teenagers. Uh, But yes, uh, you can absolutely uh, meet here with your care group and feed the students and your care group at the same time. Anybody else? All right, I believe Joel is next, yes? We're going to call up uh, Deanna to talk about the nursery and then Joel. We have had, in the past, we've had four coordinators and they, that would do one week a month and that was, that was pretty heavy load. Uh, now we have two coordinators, and Deanna is one of them. I did not know I'd actually have to have a microphone, by the way. I thought I'd be standing up right there. Um, yeah, right now it's just Tiffany and I doing the coordinating, and all that it means as a coordinator is you're the person who makes sure there's enough people in there for the kids. Um, right now we just have sign-up sheets. We've done things online before. Um, we need at least one or two during the first hour and at least two the second hour, just for safety purposes, um, make sure everyone's okay. And um, if you love little kids, they're, they're funny. If you've never been around a two-year-old, um, I just had little, you know, Thomas's little boy crew, someone was trying to give him a fist bump and they said, blow it up, and he goes, <laughs> like it was a candle. So it's good times back there. Um, anyone can serve in the nursery, basically, women, men, youth. Uh, We've got a couple of youth back there right now helping out. Um, You play with them. You give them a snack. You check diapers. But if you're not a diaper person, there's usually at least one other adult in the room who will do that. Um, So you can come talk to me, Tiffany. Um, Debbie Essinger helps with the scheduling too. So come play with babies. And next up we have Joelle to talk about kids. 
We're almost to the finish line, guys. And for your diaper changing folks, I appreciate you. My wife appreciates you. We, we got to Houston years ago. We don't have kids of our own, so she appreciates those diaper changing folks. So if you're out there and you change diapers, thank you. <laughs> Mine will be really quickly. Uh, <clears throat> Joel Mendez, I am the outreach pastor. Uh, also now jumping into the kids ministry. Uh, so yes, uh, pray for me. Um, no, but we have, the structures are already there. The, the teachers are already there. Uh, Sunday mornings right now, my wife is doing something that she's never done. She's never taught kids, but I laid it out for her. She just texted me. She's doing, she said it went perfect. So my wife, Carmen, she's a part of the kids ministry as well. And so uh, one of the things that we do need is kids, uh, church volunteers. And so <coughs> right now we're good, but as with anything, we, we would love to ha uh, have more folks uh, jump in on that. So right now, uh, we're leaning on the, s on the folks that are already there in the kids' ministry. Uh, so I appreciate you guys uh, being gracious as uh, I take that uh, baton in the kids' ministry uh, there. I think <coughs> uh, curriculum on Sunday mornings and Wednesdays, we will reassess in during the summer. I will probably scale it down and make it more simplified for you teachers that are out there. But the structures are already there. We have uh, Sunday morning classes from pre-K through fifth grade. And then we have Power Zone at uh, right now during this time. And then on Wednesday evenings, we have classes for everybody as well. So the structure is already there as well. VBS, June 23rd through June 26th. So put that on your calendars. We are moving forward with VBS, June 23rd through June 26th. That's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. So probably this week or week and a half, I will have already volunteer signing a uh, table up here in the hallway. And so if you've never served, this is a great time to jump in. And it's going to be very uh, different this year. So it will look a little bit different, but that's okay because it allows us to kind of jump in and get our feet wet. Uh, some of you guys, I've already reached out to some of you, and some of you guys are stepping up again. So thank you very much for that. And uh, that's all I've got. Any questions? And I'll mention kids camp, since I'm the one leading that, Joel will be focused on VBS that month. Uh, we still have a couple spots left for Cross Timbers camp for your third through sixth grader if they would like to go, and we need a male sponsor. Doesn't have to be one of your kids to come and enjoy camp and to bless our kids. I am the one male sponsor, and we've said pray for me a lot, but it's like a whole other level of like if it's just me and the, all the boys. So No, uh, we need one more male sponsor, so if, if that might be you, talk to me. Uh, just real quick on the next slide, I'm not going to talk about these things, but just so you know, these are other, and, and then I'll, prayer team, doesn't, it's not just elders, and uh, I mean, that is open, let us know, missions committee, decorating committee, uh, facilities, we've had deacons do that in the past, right now we have one deacon, and he's really focused on finances, uh, mowing crew is an area where we need to get a rotation, and uh, if, if you can, CDL bus driver, that would be a need, go ahead. Um, I'm the chairman of the missions committee, and I don't know who is on the committee. So we're going to put a sign-up sheet in the back for next week. And if you want to be a part of the missions committee, I would love to have your name and phone number. Um, we haven't met in several years because there's other ways of communicating, but we can meet. And um, our missions committee... We serve in a lot of places around the world. Mm -hmm. And so we, we need your help in deciding some issues such as if they have a special need, do we back that? How, how does that work? Mm -hmm. So um, next week, if you're interested, look for the sign-up sheet, and we will go from there. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for – yes, go ahead, Debbie. Debbie. That paper is sufficient, yes, and you can just go drop it on Debbie's desk. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to do that or hand it to me on the way out. Um, thank you. Thank you all for your patience. I'm not going to ask for Q&A right now just due to time, but we're staying. And so uh, any questions you have, and then in a few more minutes, we'll officially, for anyone that wants to discuss um, the past and what led us to this decision, their yeah. elders are available.
don't have questions, I would ask you to stay and listen, mm -hmm. um, get a better understanding. Mm -hmm. Would that be fair, Dr. Shea? That's a fair idea. Um, but I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. Sorry. Thank everyone. We want to thank you. The Elder Board wants to thank you for being here this morning mm -hmm. and taking part in this meeting. Um, it's an encouragement to us, so thank you. <clears throat> and we would also encourage each and every one of you that, that if you have any questions or concerns that you think about mm -hmm. later on, to give us a call, Let, catch us in the hall, whatever the case might be. We're more than willing to visit with anybody about anything. Um, we're available. And, and if, please don't hesitate to ask any. The only dumb questions are ones that don't get asked. Mm -hmm. And so whatever is on your mind, if you want to talk, we're perfectly willing and, and, and would love to visit with each and every, any of you who, who might have questions or whatever the case might be. Right. We're going to do about a five-minute break now. Yeah, three to five, which is an opportunity to clear. Okay. Let me go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege of it, that it is to be a part of your church. May we give you glory and always say amen.